Hello, my name is Aaron Huey. I am 38 years old. I live in Seattle, Washington in the U.S., and I am a photographer, photojournalist, and artist. Uh, I'm most known as a photojournalist, especially I'm when I'm working for National Geographic magazine. Uh, and my history as a photographer began with traditional documentary work, photographing news events and crisis and multiple year projects in communities. Well, I mean, working for National Geographic is some of my favorite work because it's special because I get more time than anywhere else. I get more resources than anywhere else, and I know that it will reach more people than anywhere else. So I know that work will go to tens and tens of millions of people and can change history and can change policy. Uh, so it has more reach. So that's I love that work for that reason. Well, my project in the Pine Ridge Indian Reservation lasted over seven years and is really ongoing in a lot of ways. The Pine Ridge project started when I stumbled into this Indian Reservation in the United States and was shocked at what I found and the visual material was beautiful and I knew there was so much more I could do with it. Even though magazines didn't want it and told me it had already been done, uh, I kept going back on my own money for years and years investing all of my own funds uh, until I had created something magazines couldn't ignore. You know, and that took me I guess maybe four or five years until I did uh, a really big international lecture uh, called the TED Talks. And, but everything before that was magazines telling me that it had been done and they didn't want it. So that was my own drive and determination and returning to that place over and over again that eventually made something different than anyone else had ever made. I think I've always had the confidence to make whatever I made on my own terms and I've always taken risks in that way. I don't I never wait to save up the money or hope that something will happen in a year or two if I have that inclination I'm going to do it right now and I'll do whatever I have to do to get that money if it means I have to use some credit cards and go into debt. I'm going to do that before I'm going to wait 2 years to save up some of my pennies to go do something, I'm going to do it right now. Um, and so it was like that before photojournalism, and I think it's, it's like that with photojournalism now. I think I mean in terms of my own enrichment and knowledge and desires of what I want to see and make and do in the world, that if, if I believe something will further my own knowledge or uh, can result in something that can further the knowledge of others, I'm going to go and do that at any cost as soon as possible. I don't, I don't wait, and I didn't wait before photojournalism. I, I made big journeys on my own before I had a camera, and as I started to get photography, as it started to come into my life, that just was another extension of exploration. It was just another way for me to do that, but the way that I did it, I think, has remained the same. You know, my my first big journeys began when I left a very small town in Wyoming of 5,000 people and I went out into the world as an exchange student when I was 18 and I lived in Slovakia um, and had to learn how to speak a new language and started to travel around the world, you know, sleeping in parks and on roofs and whatever I had to do to keep moving. Um, and then later in life that became, those trips became bigger and they became even more international and I was doing whatever I had to do to save money to travel all over the world. And then at a certain point I stopped traveling around the world and I decided I want to make a really big journey at home. And I did a six month walk across America. Um, that was, actually it was less, it was only five months really. It was a very fast walk. I walked 3,349 miles. Um, how many kilometers is that? Um, I didn't do it to make a photo project, but it became one of my first published bodies of work. Um, the Smithsonian published a whole large package of photography um, sometime after that. But that was that was a huge risk. Every day was a risk on that trip. Uh, and I, I think I there is a lot of risk in the work that I do. Like I never have guarantees that something is going to work out or that somebody wants to publish it. 
but I think the strength of belief um, carries me through that, and I make my make that work no matter what. Uh, the, the risks the risks don't always have to be terrifying, you know. I'm sure there are lots of people talking these things about war and about really physically frightening things. Um, I think great photography and photojournalism is always a little uncomfortable. It doesn't have to be terrifying. Um, and when I say uncomfortable, I mean to make great work, you have to go into the unknown, and that is inherently uncomfortable. That's an uncomfortable thing to do. Um, even if it's on your own street, it's uncomfortable to walk down the street and stop a stranger and say, I want to ask you questions, I want to take your picture. That's its own unknown and it's uncomfortable in itself. Um, the rewards of going into the unknown are just an exponential expansion of your consciousness. I mean, every person you talk to that you didn't know who they were or what their ideas were, that grows your own ideas of the world and of what you could be or what the world could be. Um, and that's not something you have to cross international borders to get to. Um, you don't have to have a lot of money, you don't have to save up your whole life and go somewhere else far away. I get a lot of emails where people want to know how to do what I do or how to tell stories and I tell them, you know, do that at home, do it on your own block, do it across town or in the very least do it in your own state or country so that you can keep going there again and again because for me it's about the return it's about going back a third time, a sixth time, an eighth time, because every time you go back and come home and re-examine what it is you've made or understood about that place, you evolve or you should evolve. And you take that idea and you grow it and you grow it and you grow it. And at the end of you know, a, a series of trips, whether it's down the block or across the world, you, know, you have something of real substance. Um, that's the reward is that you you know more, you can make more, you can teach more to the people around you. Um, it's, it's all reward. I love to work for National Geographic because I know that when I do that work that it's not going to be seen by tens of thousands of people, it's going to be seen by tens of millions of people. And anytime you can get an idea or a message in front of that many people, you can create real change. Um, not everything has to result in new laws being made or uh, like things that will change the course of all human history. But I mean, in some ways, these stories can do that. You know, if I do a story about an Indian reservation in South Dakota and about uh, treaty rights, a story of that size can actually change how a state government deals with treaty rights because it's an enormous amount of pressure. Um, and information going out to the world, it could create a chain reaction of other people demanding those rights now that they know. So in that education to that many people, um, change can happen in many ways. Um, you know, and then we, ha we have lots of stories at National Geographic that are literally creating new international law because they expose things that the world can't ignore anymore. And it's kind of the final nail that makes those things acted upon. Um, these days I partner with as many people as I can. Um, I have gotten to the point where I can publish the photos that I make almost anywhere I want, but I'm not satisfied with, uh, I guess the boundaries on a lot of magazines and even websites about what those existing platforms can do. I want collaborators that can help break those walls. And so, for me, finding partners like Shepard Ferry, who is a street artist, um, does exactly that. Um, there are no rules in street art. We don't have to care about what advertisers think or if what we make is politically correct. Um, we make the message we want together, and we put it in the streets, and we put it on walls, and we don't ask anyone's permission. The, the reason that I went to the streets was because I think that people that subscribe to magazines already believe what they're going to read. You subscribe to Harper's because you're already a lefty, you already are a Democrat, and you already believe those ideas, yeah. and in general you're going you're gonna to basically agree with most of the things you're reading. If you take uh, photography or messages into the streets, um, it's more democratic because people can't choose what they see or don't see, they have to be confronted with it. The people that wouldn't subscribe to those magazines will see the messages, the people that would 
not want to see those messages will see the messages. The, the difference, for me, one of the great things about, uh, about social media and the web is that I have more ways now, um, whether it's alone or with collaborators, to get messages and imagery out unfiltered. So maybe a, a particular magazine will say, we're only going to take a little piece of this that fits into our ideas and the structure we have right now. But I can find 20 other venues that will take it unfiltered with more of a twist uh, and more of the way that I see it maybe because when we turn in our photographs they get edited by a lot of people and the ideas begin to change. Um, if I put something straight into an Instagram feed that is exactly what I'm thinking right now and what I've seen on the ground going straight to the audience. You know, and through National Geographic, I can communicate a photograph and a series of words with no filters of any kind to 5.6 million people. I could do it right now. The second this interview is over, I could get, I could get a message and an image to 5.6 million people with no one checking it. Um, that's a different kind of power. That's a whole other way of sharing stories. Um, and maybe that's why I'm always looking for new ways to, to move stories in the world, and that's why I love collaborators. By working with Shepard Ferry as a street artist, my messages can reach whole communities that I don't reach in this journalism world. Maybe let's say the journalism world already knows Aaron Huey and his Pine Ridge project and the ideas behind that. Um, the fine art world or the street art world doesn't, and Shepard Ferry has got this huge following. Every time I partner with a person like that, it exponentially grows those networks more than double. It's like 10 times as big. And if I can pull in even another collaborator, it's even bigger. The more people and the more surprising the collaborations I can bring together, the more people I can reach. I did not even have a camera until the end of my university years, uh, maybe more than halfway through university. Um, I. I guess I would say to anybody that wants to tell stories with a camera and try to figure out how to make it out there and share those stories, this is not something that happens in some flash of genius where you go out and you just have it. Um, for me, it's certainly not been like that. I think a few people in the world it works like that, but not for most of us. Um, I like to compare it to just hacking through tall weeds with a dull machete over and over again for years and years. And even where I am in this career, I still feel like I'm in deep, deep weeds, and I will be for the rest of my life. And my machete is just getting a little sharper. Um, but I, I, it's relentless work. You just keep going back. You find one thing you really love, and you go after it, and you, you bring it home, and you look at it, and you re-examine its ideas and its aesthetics, and you evolve it in, with the second trip, and you fill in holes, and you go and come back and do the same thing, go back a third trip, and a fourth trip, and a twelfth trip, and a twentieth trip. And that's why doing something really close to home, really deep, is the way to go, I think, especially in the beginning, because then you can keep evolve you can evolve it faster. You can make that project evolve because you can keep revisiting it. If you come up with something on the other side of the world, it's very hard to evolve it um, quickly like that. Um, Find one thing you love. Don't photograph everything necessarily. Find that one thing and find its soul. Go all the way into the soul of that thing. Um, and and I, I think that's, that's where you'll find your art and that's uh, how you'll find the thing that matters and that other people will recognize as that thing that matters. Yeah. Uh, the collaboration with Shepard Ferry was really the beginning of what now is involving dozens of other artists and is going to become an entire nonprofit foundation um, for arts and advocacy. Uh, so something that started as just photojournalism uh, turned into street art is now going to be an entire global movement of art to create change. And photography is just one of those arts. And by doing the project in this way, we bring we bring photographers and photography together with great artists um, and move that work into the streets. So um, there's no boundaries on where it can go. We're going to be dealing with big global campaigns on the environment, um, still focusing on uh, indigenous issues, on native communities, but, um, but going uh, 
all over the world with this in the coming years.